remember. Some of it, and if you've got a Bible, you might want to have it open at Acts chapter 9 uh, in front of you anyway. And uh, I'm not going to do a verse by verse, pick our way through it, because we could be here quite a long time, uh, but we will think about it in, in another way this morning. Let's just pray as we do that, shall we? Heavenly Father, we pray your blessing on this next time, next part of our time together this morning, that you would just uh, enable us to hear your Spirit speaking to us in whatever way we need to hear from you. Uh, we pray your blessing and your help and strength now in Jesus' name. Amen. Instead of doing verse by verse, um, I've been thinking about how we can look at uh, these this passage that we have, which contains these two distinctive but connected stories, uh, and uh, how we can how we can look at that together. And uh, I started thinking about um, concentric circles, circles within circles within circles. And as you uh, get closer, you, you find what's really at the centre of it all. Don't know whether you've ever used uh, Google Earth. Anybody ever played around with Google Earth? If you haven't used Google Earth, you need to use Google Earth. It's brilliant. You can spy on people. It's great fun. We used it, we used it quite a bit, and uh, we've used it when we've gone away on holiday somewhere just to sort of find uh, where we'll be, what it looks like, and where the roads are, and all the rest of it. And I remember particularly when we went to see some friends a number of years ago, we went to see some friends in America, and uh, we Googled their address, and we were actually able to zoom in on their house and their garden. But you start off with the planet, and then you gradually work your way down to the continent, to the country, to the city, and uh, to the location where the person is, where the house is. And it's amazing the detail that you can find. Perhaps we can think about the passage this morning a bit like a, a parcel. -a -parcel. I don't know whether you like pass the parcel. It can be a bit infuriating, can't it? You know, particularly if people don't play fair. That's the thing that's very annoying. Children are sticklers, aren't they, when it comes to fairness and justice? But with a pass the parcel, usually there's a, there's a commonality, isn't there? There's a there's a layer of paper. They're not always the same layer. Not always the same colour. But there's a layer of paper, and you take off the layer, and it reveals something else. That reveals something else, and eventually you get to the heart of it. Um, the idea is that what, when you do a parcel parcel, just for future reference, if you're planning something for Christmas, it's supposed to be something worth having in the middle, all right? Very disappointing if all you get is a rubber or a pencil sharpener in the middle. It's supposed to be worth having. There should be something at the center that makes the effort worth it. But gradually, the layers come off. A number of years ago, and I think this was the way I, I, I wanted in the end to, to think about it, was this. A number of years ago, uh, my brother uh, had a, a girlfriend, not his wife, um, before they were married. Just thought I should say that. Uh, his first girlfriend when they were both students, and she was a student of Russian. And one of the things that happened was that she had to spend uh, the third year of her four years in Russia. And uh, I know at various times she came home and she brought members of her family and our family little gifts from Russia. And uh, one of the things that she gave to my brother, just because it was typically Russian, not because he particularly would appreciate it, uh, was a set of Russian dolls. I don't know whether you've ever seen those Russian dolls. And, uh, you know, he's not particularly into dolls. That would be the last thing on his mind. But they're typically Russian. But the thing about Russian dolls is that as you take the top off, take the head off the doll, inside there's another one, and then inside there's another one, but it's usually the same motif all over each of them. So every time you open one, there's one that looks identical except it's smaller, and then you go to the next one, and as you gr eventually you come to the smallest one in the center, and it's just a reduced same doll with the same motif. Throughout this passage and in the bit before, there's a motif that, that goes through the whole passage. And really the motif, I think, is this. Jesus is Lord. We've got it in our hymns this morning, in our songs together. Jesus is Lord. And in a sense, what difference that makes uh, to situations. The background to the two stories of the healing of Aeneas and the raising to life of Tabitha is, of course, the conversion of Saul of Tarsus. Uh, he was saved in a miraculous way. You'll remember the story on the road to Damascus. Eventually, he, after a, a, a bit of trouble, a bit of local difficulty, shall we say, in Damascus, he returns to Jerusalem. But, of course, that causes trouble too. And uh, 
The reason it causes trouble is because Paul, Saul, is actively proclaiming that Jesus of Nazareth is indeed Lord. He is the Messiah and that He has risen from the dead and that He is a Savior to all who will believe. And, and that proclamation receives opposition, encounters opposition, and, and that is always the way. Nonetheless, we must restate this morning, and it's our privilege, it's our joy to be able to do that, isn't it? We restate that Jesus Christ is Lord. The Bible teaches us that one day every knee will bow and every tongue will confess that He is Lord. Of course, that arouses opposition in the world around us, and that was what Paul experienced. But the motif there was still, it's Jesus Christ is Lord, Jesus is Lord. After that, we see that there's this time of peace for the church. The church takes the opportunity. Instead of opposition now, there's opportunity, uh, and the church takes the opportunity to move out of uh, their comfort zone, move towards other people, go into the local areas and beyond. There's a time of peace. The blessing of God is experienced as they depend on Him, and many people are saved. Many people are converted. And why are they converted? Because they come to believe that Jesus Christ is Lord. So instead of opposition, there are opportunities. And then we come to this passage, Acts 9, 32 to 43. And we see Peter leaving Jerusalem uh, and doing the rounds, doing pastoral visits to the various believers, to the various congregations in the towns uh, and cities around. And so he heads off to Lydda. He's probably been to, to various other places, but he finds himself heading to Lydda. And in Lydda, he encounters Aeneas. We don't know whether Aeneas uh, was a believer. I think it's implied. He visits the church there, and there's a certain man called Aeneas. And Aeneas has been unwell, unable to move, bedridden for eight years. Uh, and in the name of Jesus Christ, Peter heals him. He's able to heal him because... Jesus is Lord, and Jesus is Lord in that story over sickness. And then we've had the, the next part that I recapped with the children, where he's called by the believers in Joppa to go and uh, deal with the situation of Tabitha's death. And here we see Tabitha raised to life, a remarkable story and Jesus is Lord again over even death itself. Opposition, then opportunities, and then Jesus is Lord over sickness and death. And it's a bit like beginning to open the layers to go in the concentric circles or to take the heads off the Russian dolls, if you like. As you, as you dig deeper, you find something else. So we've got this background. Then we've got Peter's pastoral visits. We've got these two stories of healings story of a resurrection. But then if you take the next layer off, what, what is this really about? What is it telling us? What is it showing? Well, you know, this is a, an interesting passage. These miracles validated the apostles' authority, and they validated the message of the gospel that they were proclaiming. It validated what they were saying, that Jesus Christ is Lord. And it could be seen by those around that the, the ministry of Jesus was ongoing. The lordship of Jesus was being seen in these situations, and his ministry was ongoing. That there was power in the name of Jesus. His work continued. And these two stories of a, a healing and a resurrection are very similar to two of the stories uh, in the New Testament where the Lord himself was involved Remember the story of the paralyzed man who was let down through the, the roof of the building and they have had all the plaster and all the mess everywhere and, and he's let down on ropes by his friends because there's just so many people in the place. And Jesus heals him. And then just remember the story of the ruler of the synagogue, Jairus, and, and the way that Jesus raised her to life. And uh, if you look at the words that are used, there's only one letter difference in, in what's said. And so we see that there's, there's the validation of this gospel message of their authority and that this power was real and that Jesus' work was continuing. And also, 
uh, the thing that they were saying, these, these disciples, these strange people, were saying that Jesus had risen from the dead. Well, they'd just seen someone else rise from the dead. And in a sense, it proves the resurrection of Christ himself. We can start with opposition, then we have opportunities, and then we see the lordship of Jesus over sickness and death, and then we see the ongoing ministry. So we're beginning to unpack and take the layers off, and then we move to something else, something even greater than those two physical healings. You see, those miracles were pointers, just like the miracles of the Lord Jesus were pointing to who he was and what he'd come to do. Those two miracles pointed to what Jesus could do in greater measure for us and for the people who Peter and others were encountering at the time. Because you see, there's a greater miracle than physical healing of somebody's inability to walk. There's even a greater miracle than the resurrection of a dead body. It's hard for us to believe, but there's a greater miracle, and that greater miracle is a resurrection of a dead spiritual life. It's a restarting, a rekindling of a relationship with God. The salvation of an individual is the most amazing miracle. And as we see Aeneas given strength to walk, it should point us to the power that God has through the Lord Jesus and through faith in Him to enable broken sinners, incapable of doing anything for ourselves, to come back into relationship with Him and for lives to be changed. As we see Dorcas, Tabitha, raised from the dead, it points us to the fact that through the Lord Jesus, His work on the cross, His resurrection, sinners such as we are, dead in our sins, dead in our relationship to God, are brought to new life in Him through faith in what His Son has done, uh, and we find a restored purpose. This miracle of healing, this miracle of resurrection, they point us to an even greater miracle of what God can do and what God wants to do in each of our lives. I hope we've experienced that. Do you know what it is to be in a relationship with the living God, to know your sins forgiven, to know that relationship, that new life in Him? And then we can unpack it a little bit more. As we look at the life of Tabitha Dorcas, we see that salvation experience, Christian faith professed, well, that should lead to a life of devotion to the Lord, the blessing of others, and maybe a stepping out of our comfort zone. Uh, I've tried to keep most of these starting with the word, with the letter O, so this time it's not opposition, it's not opportunities, it's not over sickness and death, it's not ongoing, it's not over sin. This time, it's others. The practical demonstration of the love of God and the practical work of the Holy Spirit in our lives so that we change and so that we live lives to His glory and we bless others. And as we bless them, we point them also uh, to the one who they need to know and who wants them to know Him. Our salvation should lead to a change. It should lead to uh, a restored relationship with God and with others. And He calls us day by day to put into practice our professed faith in Him. Where does that leave us really this morning? Ownership. I wonder whether we have ever acknowledge truly that Jesus Christ is Lord. I'm assuming most people here have this morning, but I wonder whether you have or whether it's secondhand. Do you have ownership over that? Do you believe that He's your Lord? Do you believe He died for you, that His death and resurrection is sufficient for your sin to be paid for, for your re relationship with God to be restored and for eternity to be secured? Do you believe that? For yourself. Well, if you do, that's wonderful. That's a miracle. That's not something that, that I can achieve. That's not something that even you can achieve. That happens because the Holy Spirit opens your heart and opens your mind uh, to see who Jesus is. But I wonder whether that's your experience this morning. If, if it is, then it doesn't stop there, does it? And that's the point of Tabitha's 
life and, and I think why we have her testimony outlined for us that faith in Jesus is to be outworked in our lives. And as we look at Tabitha Dorcas, perhaps the thing that we can take from that is that it's the small things that matter. Small things that matter. We need to get our focus right in terms of what's important. You know, society around us says that power and position, here we go with all the P's now, next letter of the alphabet, power, position, and possessions, and property, and prestige are what matters. But you know, the Bible says it's people, people around us. You know, the Lord Jesus died for people like us, and people not like us. People are the supreme part of God's creation. Have a look at the book of Genesis. And people will outlast the created order of the world itself. And God calls you and me, just like Tabitha, I believe, to invest in people, in our time and our money and our, and our love, in order to nudge others towards the Lord, to reflect His love and to reflect the mercy that we've received to them and so point them to Christ. You know, in heaven, one day, we won't be surrounded by uh, our possessions or, or titles or our success. But, you know, if we've lived our lives wisely as believers, we will be surrounded by people whose lives we've touched. So how can we make a difference now? How can we live a life of impact now? Well, think small. I'm sure that's how Tabitha Dorcas began. And yet, in response to the relatively small things that she did, notice the strong reaction there was. People were really upset. They rushed to get Peter. There was crying and tears. Tabitha's deeds, well, it wasn't huge gifts that she gave to people. But what she did do was take time to personalize things. Do you realize that the, the clothing that's mentioned, really, it's, it's outer garments and undergarments. So she was making not just the fancy stuff, she was probably making the underwear as well. Funny for us to think, isn't it? But the Bible is that detailed. They weren't huge things, but made a lot of difference to the lives of those around her. You know, sometimes the small actions can matter more than grand gestures. The small and careful actions can make a difference in the life of somebody around us. What can we do today? In the family of God's people, yes, and in those around us in our community, so we make a difference and we reflect the love of God. Well, the practical things. I'm sure you've got an exhaust, you know, you've, your list would be probably far longer than I've put together here this morning, but things we can do. A card, a phone call. It's amazing what difference that makes. A text, an offer to pray for somebody and then actually do it. Giving somebody some food, helping them with that. Mowing somebody's lawn, giving them a lift even if it is at the risk of getting your beautifully clean car dirty again. Just listening to somebody and giving them your time. You know, life is hard for many people, and we need, all of us, at times, encouragement and mercy. But these things, small though they may, may seem, are testimony to God's love. They go hand in hand with the sharing of the gospel message itself, but they're a demonstration of His love. We should do these things because they're good of themselves, but as we do them, we are the hands, we are the voice, we are the feet of Jesus, but we pray and we hope, and then we take opportunities to answer questions and to introduce Christ in the ordinary things of life, but we need to engage with those around us. What may stop us from doing those things? Well, you know, we may have bought into the, the, the thinking of our age, which says that uh, if we're going to have an impact, then it needs to be visible and it needs to be huge. And we live our lives surrounded by people who uh, spend an awful lot of time on Facebook. And the way they judge their success is by how many likes they get or how many friends they've got. And yet it's the unseen work that's important. We might, have, we might have bought into that. We might think that it has to be huge. We might be self-centered, unfortunately. And also, we might be unwilling to, to take a risk and put our heart out there. And yet, we look for approval sometimes uh, from the crowd instead of pleasing the Lord who sees the small and the unobtrusive. We focus sometimes too much on ourselves 
And yet the Scriptures teach us to look not only to our own interests, but to the interests of others. Remember that the Lord Jesus, it says of Him, the Son of Man came not to be served, but to serve. Now, sometimes we just don't want to get involved in, in the mess that we see of other people's lives, and we're unwilling to take the risk and step out and get our hands dirty. And yet, you know when you do, yes, it is a mess. Sometimes it never seems to end, but you know it's pleasing to the Lord. Sometimes we're too timid to, to open our hearts. Maybe we have a, a lack of self-confidence or we're afraid of being rejected by people. But you know, God, throughout His Word, we see it in the Bible. He equips the called. He doesn't usually call the equipped. And He calls us this morning to follow the leading of the Holy Spirit, not just now in this place this morning, but as we go into this week, so that our lives make a difference to those around us. And as they make a difference, even if we're not naturally those who share our faith, maybe an opportunity will come. Maybe somebody will ask a question as to why you're doing it. Or maybe there will be an opportunity when someone is struggling or going through difficulties for you to introduce Christ. As you take the dolls apart, as you go to the center of the circles, as you unpack the parcel, what's right at the center? Well, all of this in this passage, in these two stories, all of it eventually points to the Lord Jesus. Actually, all of Scripture really points to the Lord Jesus. But this story, these two accounts, point us to Jesus. He's the central element, the person who makes the difference, the one in whose name these things are done, who provides the power and who changes lives. I wonder what your response is to him this morning, to his life, his death, his resurrection, and to the claims that he would make upon you. Let's pray. Let's ask him to bless us to help us that we might respond and in His strength and in the power of His Spirit, we might, in increasing measure this week, be the kind of people that He wants us to be. Let's pray. Father, we thank You for what we read in Your Word of these amazing incidents, demonstrations of Your power, but we thank You that as we look at these things, we see so much more than meets the eye immediately. We thank You that they were uh, indications that you are truly alive, Lord Jesus, that you had risen from the dead, that your ministry was ongoing, that the message was true. Uh, and we thank you for the way that they point to what you can do uh, in broken lives, in the broken lives of sinful people. And we thank you that you restore and you bring back to life and you bring into relationship with you those who, who are lost and far away. And Father, we thank you for the example of, of Tabitha. We pray that you'd help us uh, as we go from this place today, that our lives would be changed uh, for the good. You'd help us to remember the, the small things that she did that made a difference, that brought others uh, into a relationship with you because they probably asked questions, uh, because they saw the difference that you make. Father, help us always uh, to point others to you, not to ourselves, that you might have all the glory. We pray in Jesus' name. Amen. I did wonder how we're going to shoehorn this all in this morning, but um, you have to bear with me uh, as far as...